Hello, everyone. It's Shane Conto, your Way Slam reviewer. Welcome to the Development Hell Podcast, and it's the movie club here again, except it's a much smaller group. Is is two people a group? Well, it's Joe and I here to talk about some cool hand loop. So, Joe, let's get started talking about the film. This is a 1967 film starring Paul Newman as a man who gets sent to a basically a work prison camp because he chopped off the heads of parking meters. Yeah. And I'm like, this is like a really harsh punishment. Yeah. For like getting put away and having to work on the highways because like you cut the head off of like a meter and still change. But this film is one of like the fixtures of late sixties that like rebellious nature that counterculture kind yeah. of thing, anti-establishment. But Joe, yeah, um, was this the first time that you watched the film? One hundred percent, first time. I actually, um, I suggested this club, this movie. I was, I'm glad it got chosen, um, because I think it was a good transition, uh, from the apartment, uh, because a lot of people have considered the apartment to be new Hollywood ish. That transitionary mm-hmm. film going into like deeper themes and and techniques and. You watch cool, cool Hand Luke, and I feel like it's kind of an extension of that. You know, like you have a movie that's shot in like what is it, Panavision? Uh, am I getting it right? Like it's a gorgeous looking movie it sure on is. a very serious, like you're saying it early, like a very serious subject matter, which is anti-establishment. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this came out during during Vietnam, and it's I would I would venture to say it's very apparent that the themes of uh, anti-war, you know. Are, are into this film as well. I mean, you have your main character who's, who's a veteran, right? Mm-hmm. Who basically is, you know, kind of, uh, you know, rebellious in a, in a sense. And it kind of reflects, you know, the, the, you know, the thing that's going on in the country at the time. Well, and this is probably the fourth time I've watched this film. I remember watching this. It was the first film I watched in cinema class in high school. No and kidding. Yep, and we got to dive into the world of Lucas Jackson. Uh, Mm -hmm. Cool ham, Luke. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the film starts... This is a gorgeous film. It's incredibly Mm -hmm. well shot. There's so much texture and life to everything. Um, Mm -hmm. Cinematographer Conrad L. Hall does such a great job of... Like, you know this is on film. You could feel the richness in, like... There's a lot of yellows, a lot of blues, because they're all dressed in head to toe blue um, because of their uh, prison attire. And mm. they're they're chopping weeds and it's all that like <laughs> golden, like dying grass and weeds mm-hmm. everywhere. Mm-hmm. And this film is such a deep, deep allegory for Christ. And it's mm-hmm. very apparent throughout this whole entire film that Luke is supposed to be a Christ-like figure who comes into this oppressive experience because you have uh, Strother Martin, who's, you know, the captain's like, what we have here is failure to communicate. Mm -hmm. And what he wants, yes! And, like, he's such, like, an iconic antagonist. And then you have Godfrey. Yeah. Totally not not on accident, named Godfrey, and he's a hollow voice. Like, you don't really talk, and he has those empty eyes. It's the those aviators and the incredible shots of seeing yeah. things reflected in it, especially that shot of when they get away with the truck, and you just see it in his eyes. And yeah. this was actually homaged perfectly in oh brother where art thou i was just gonna say that it's almost like yeah. the cohen brothers are like how can we make cool hand luke in the odyssey you know the cool hand luke in the story the story of uh cool hand luke but it's the story of the odyssey put together <laughs> yeah because they are chain gang this is a chain gang it is working on <laughs> chain gang working on the side of the highway and i just love the story because like you start to have Luke and his apostles. Yeah. Because you have, you got that drag line. Moss, mm-hmm. um, it's like Moss Water. That George, George Kennedy's so good in this. Love yeah. him. He's like, ooh, my Lucille. Also, <laughs> the Temptress 
is named Lucille. Lucifer. Mm. And this this woman knew and like Luke got it right. This woman's like rubbing the the suds all over her and like she like she knows exactly what she's doing. Yeah. And she knows yeah. they're watching her. And mm. she's enjoying every single second of it. And they're like, oh, la Lucille. Mm -hmm. George Kennedy is so great in this. And yeah. you have him like getting beat down by Dragline in that boxing match and will not stay down. You have him complete a miracle. Yeah. Eating the eggs. Mm. And that's the moment where everybody gets behind him. And when he's done, he's sprawled out. Yeah. On the table. Like Christ. And also the final final shot of the film of that crossroads, which is a cross, and that picture of Luke pops up ripped in quarters. Wow. It's just like right. there's so much religious imagery in this movie. Yeah. Obviously, like I learned about this in cinema class and it obviously impacted me because I remember it. I took that in like 2007, 2008. So, like, it's been a long time since the first time I watched this film. And I just love how rich thematically this film is. But it's not just working on this Christ figure allegory. It's working on, this is an embodiment of the late 60s anti-establishment. Yeah. Luke is a rebel. Mm -hmm. 100%. And everything that he does is rebellious. Even mm -hmm. when it seems like he's all like yes sir yes boss he still steals the truck yeah he's like, never, he, lying, never lying down right it, it, it's sort of like how you know the true nature of it it's like you can say say what you're saying but it does it's not acting what you're saying and and, and a lot of what newman is doing is that he conveys such a you know what he's thinking like mm -hmm. he is but at the same time, too, he has that poker face. And you know he's got that poker face where he can tell you what you want to hear sometimes. But a lot of times his actions don't necessarily show that. Like, he is just, he is, I need to see more Paul Newman movies. <laughs> he is so cool. He really yeah. is. Paul Newman. Mark Hudson, the, man. <laughs> well, Paul Newman was one of the greatest actors we ever mm. had. Mm. And, some of my, and he did in so many different decades. Like mm -hmm. this in the 60s, you have the sting and everything in like the 70s. You have Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Even That's a fantastic 80s, film. The 80s, he finally won an Oscar for Color of Money. He's mm -hmm. so good in that. And I, The Hustler is one of my favorite films yeah. of all time. And even up to like Road to Perdition, which was his last live action role. And even like and that was in the early 2000s, early 90s with the Hudsucker Proxy. And like he just could nail any role so perfectly. Yeah. He just has so much charisma. Those eyes, like yeah. his piercing blue eyes and that look that he has. And a lot of his career, he was a little older because like once you hit the 70s, you can tell that he started aging. Like mm -hmm. even in like The Sting, he looks like a middle-aged man compared to Robert yeah. Redford. And he he was able to still continue to just do some such fantastic work. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of George Kennedy, whether it's from like the Dirty Dozen, from this, Naked Gun. Um, <laughs> I was so surprised to see him. I was like, oh, that's uh, that's his partner. Uh, yeah. uh, that, or, uh, that's totally Naked his gun. partner. <laughs> and George Kennedy is so great in this as drag line and there's so many small performances from a lot of different people too because you have um well like i mentioned uh struther martin's great as the captain you have clifton james who'd wind mm -hmm. up popping up in like james bond movies and stuff like that as that like southern sheriff he's the one who's inside they're doing like dennis hopper is one of the prisoners harry dean stanton is one of the prisoners wow. and harry dean stanton's the one who's singing those classic of uh, folk songs throughout like ain't no grave he sings mm. cotton fields 
-hmm. and i'm just sitting there like i know all these songs like mm -hmm. ain't no grave covered by john cash cotton fields by credence and it's like the feel the music of this this feel this film captures that like southern grassroot setting so perfectly yeah. and yeah. they make a great use out of it because you see them out cutting weeds on the highway a lot whenever yeah. luke escapes you just get such a sense of like what the, the world around them is like and yeah it's no wonder like this was not a great time for people mm -mm. in the south at this point and it's just like you wonder how all these men like wind up in this situation where it's like they wind up conforming and just living this life of like they understand that they have rules they're taken care of and they go out and do their work yeah they even have fun doing it they mess around with the newbies uh yeah. trying to con guys out of money to switch jobs when you know for a fact that wasn't going to go over no nope. it's one of those kinds of things where it's such an interesting look at humanity mm -hmm. and it's so impressive that you have this character of lucas jackson who's endlessly charismatic mm -hmm. the way that he so effortlessly just rebels and the mm -hmm. way that he interacts and the way that he has this connection with everybody mm -hmm. everybody feels drawn to him and yeah. you, I love seeing that community building and you build the myth around him. Yeah. Just like Jesus. Yeah. Like even and, the beginning of the movie, right? Mm -hmm. When he's meeting the, uh, the captain, it's like, they don't even necessarily hate him and they don't treat him like the other prisoners. They are kind of still drawn by him, you mm -hmm. know, like his, pre like they're in the presence of someone. And usually that happens like when you're in the presence of someone that just may not even be better than you, but just has this, this, uh, this chutzpah, let's just call it that. Yeah. You know, they just have the chutzpah and then you're just kind of like, you're attracted to it. And they feel like he just has that. Well, yeah, the, the guards feel drawn to him too. Mm -hmm. And they feel bad, especially mm -hmm. with, oh, that whole scene with him and his mother, mm -hmm. with her oh, like yeah. still smoking on her deathbed um is so impactful in that way and it's just such an engaging scene like the two actors uh working together in that scene and mm -hmm. then when she dies even the guards are like mm -hmm. you okay and like that that was the moment <laughs> where they pushed like they poked the bear mm -hmm. when they put him in the box just so that he would but you knew like Luke wasn't going to be running away. He gave no sense, but they're like, we're going to have to put you in, in there anyway. And that's the moment where you knew he wasn't playing around with that anymore. No. And I love the fact that like this film really takes a shot at the structural issues that are in law and the penal system. And what's the point? Like, really, what's the point of what's going on here is they have free free labor. Mm -hmm. And, like, our American society gave up, you know, the South lost slavery. So they lost mm -hmm. slaves, and they just turned prisoners into them instead. They yeah. don't have a choice. This whole yeah. entire system, it's like, it pays a lot of those Southern municipalities to have people in prison. So that yeah. they could throw them out for free labor. And that's yeah, exactly just look at the war on drugs out. too, right? You know, like the whole issue of just have a small bag of weed just to, to early on to just uh, put them 30 years to life. But yeah, and looking at this kind of film, it's it's really a capture of how the government leverages our prison system to take advantage of people. It's mm -hmm. like, there's no reason like, this guy was drunk. He cut the head off some parking meters and stole some change. Like, why is he in a labor camp, like, on a chain gang? Because they use him for free labor. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's so much cor systematic corruption that centers around this. And you can tell, like, who are the kinds of people that want jobs like this? The ones that want power and can easily be 
uh, warped by it because you could tell like the captain and Godfrey. Uh, it's that kind of thing where you have those kinds of people that are taking advantage of the system. You can tell Godfrey gets a lot out of. Like he doesn't say much, but like you can tell he enjoys that status that he has. Um, it's one of those kinds of things where, and like the captain acts like he's all, it's like, oh, it'd be fine. It's like, it's not what Luke wanted, he gets. Mm -hmm. It's you force those things on him. And there's some reasonable reactions to like, you were going against the social structure of like what was promised. And like the box is like a torturous kind of thing. You're mm. making men just sit out there burning up. It's, yeah. it's really messed up. And this really gets down to the nitty gritty of like, what's prison supposed to be about? Is it mm. about reform or punishment? Because this is punishment. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, it's sort of like how the the, the prison experiments in the 70s, the Stanford prison experiment really shows that when you give people power, right, it corrupts. You are, they, it, power corrupts people. And, you know, I just look at those aviators as being such an iconic image. Like you see it in cartoons, you see it in other media of like, this is the boss. This is the, this is, this is the, this is, this is the a hole, you know, <laughs> this is the person you want to take down. It's very iconic. Absolutely. And you brought up a point about just how Luke connects with all these different characters. Mm -hmm. He really it like he is that force that comes in and shakes up the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's oh. interesting. I'm sorry to cut you off there, but it's oh. it's interesting how like um there's there's the archetype, I guess you could say like, you know, Christ like archetype of just having a relatable person. Because like I mentioned to you off camera, but like I think about you know, a lot of Victor Hugo's work, like uh, yep. Les Mis, right? Where you got a character that doesn't do a huge crime, but has to deal with a huge crime, and you kind of just follow them along. And I would even argue kind of like, is it okay, fair for me to say Uncle Tom's Cabin in some ways? Like, it's, think that'd be it's, fair? Sure. And, you know, looking at Les Mis and Jean Valjean, steals bread to mm -hmm. And it's just like, nope, you're going to get like tortured and put to work and all this kind of stuff. The punishment does not meet the crime in so many of these situations. And it's all about the leveraging of, in this particular situation, free labor. It was probably the same thing in France. Like, mm -hmm. sure, we'd love to have some free labor, put those prisoners to work. And the unfortunate thing is a lot, some of these people didn't have much better options. So they'll take it. They'll take mm -hmm. the guaranteed meals. They'll take the time outside and like mm. yeah it could dehydrate you you could collapse out there but you know it's there's little moments at the beginning of the film where all the characters are like slow it down save your energy and because they know they've they've completely assimilated they know what it's like to be in the system mm -hmm. and then luke strolls and it's like what would happen if we get done early and that is such a great scene where they talk, like they cover the tarred ground with the sand and everything, and they get done early and they get to rest. Mm -hmm. And that is Luke coming in here and completely shaking up the system. He is a mm -hmm. shock to the system. He is such a natural force. And you need an actor like Paul Newman, who is so commanding on screen, to be able to make that come to life and make it so effective. Yeah. One thing I want to add, uh, since we brought up, up Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And I just can't help it because now I just, I realize it. Like when we're talking about. <laughs> but like, it, it makes so much sense though, because what was, what is the Odyssey? Like, what is it rooted in? It's rooted it's, in faith. Yeah, it's the, it's the myth and it is the, it is Odysseus crying to find his way home. Mm -hmm. And you know, all the adversity that he goes through, all the trials he goes through, and, you know, trusting in the gods mm -hmm. so that he could finally make it home from Troy and mm -hmm. took decades. 
for him to finally do it. And this is one of those kinds of things where this film's about like Luke carrying some of these men home. Mm. They've been they've been lost. They're all lost at sea. They're not home. They're not with their families. They're lost in this horrible situation of just a cycle of work and confinement. And the only bits of freedom they have is, you know, Tramp, Harry Dean Stanton's character singing, singing some songs for them. And it's just Luke's the one that comes in and breathes life and mm. gives them hope again. And he becomes a myth. They talk about Luke. And even uh, that final scene where Dragline brings them to him and Luke walks out the door and he's too influential at that point to not kill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if he stays in that prison any longer, those prisoners are all going to turn against mm -hmm. the system. And the mm -hmm. system has to stop it. And when Godfrey shoots him, and that was so satisfying when uh, when you have Dragline coming up and attacking him, I'm just like, yeah, hit him. Yep. And it's so satisfying. But just beautiful storytelling of the rainy, them driving down the road, and that car reaching that traffic light and it turning red. Mm -hmm. And you know that's the moment that Luke has passed away. Yeah. It's such a powerful visual this film is very poetic in the yeah. way that it incorporates its themes both visually and narratively and it's so interesting that like Stuart rosenberg who directed this this was written by don pierce this is based off of a novel by frank pearson how they make such a simple idea of one prisoner shaking things up on a chain gang so deeply rooted in not only faith, which this, this is such the interesting thing. It's the faith and it's the counterculture anti-establishment of the late 60s somehow coexist. And you would think they would not, because if you think about who are the anti-establishment, who's the anti-power of today, it's certainly not religion, but it's the ideas, though. Mm -hmm. Which also mm -hmm. says a lot about the structure of religion versus do they really represent the ideas mm -hmm. that they're supposed to be believing in. So right. that's interesting. <laughs> but it's people people making making things. We interpret what people are saying, you know? Mm -hmm. Like even just the fact of like this what makes this movie so work is it's it's all showing, not telling, you know? Mm -hmm. And that then that to me is 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 true ish. Tro cinema <laughs> in my Scorsese. That's cinema. That's cinema. Um, <laughs> I, am, I am sure Martin Scorsese loves Cool Hand. One hundred percent. I mean, cool, Color of Money. Like well, he must like, have like I a mean, shrine. He's obviously a big fan of Paul Newman. One hundred percent. And like Paul Newman was one of the ones who wanted to bring Scorsese on to do the Color of Money. Like Paul yeah. Newman. Paul Newman knew. Um, but this film is so impactful. I love just the richness and the depth and the textures of it. And sure, you can have, like, I love A24, but I know some A24 films can get lost in the art and the visuals and the themes yeah. and miss out sometimes on the character. 100%. Because it's too much focusing on the artistic elements. But like, this is so deeply rooted in such great acting. And yeah. great character work. We connect. We love Luke too. We love Luke Did, just as much as all these prisoners do. I, I'm glad you're saying that too, because you know I think that's why um, I really appreciate Paul Thomas Anderson. I was gonna say WS by accident. Um, <laughs> the good Anderson, the Paul, the good Anderson, where he, he takes this approach of like, if you really love movies, you're gonna watch everything. I don't yeah. like the people that are going to say you have to sit down, watch Citizen Kane and Igmar Bergman to truly appreciate films. It's like you like Terminator. You want to go watch Spider-Man. That's how you embrace cinema. And Cool Hand Luke has mainstream appeal. Like yes. this is a movie that is mainstream appeal. This is by no account an A24 film. I could I, Warner Brothers produced it from the opening and you can and you could still see Warner Brothers producing it. Um, it kind of actually, again, side note, 
I was in a, I was in Universal uh, in Hollywood, Universal Studios in Hollywood, and it and it made me realize that Universal Studios, like the actual studio, has not won Best Picture since A Beautiful Mind. So from Oppenheimer to A Beautiful Mind, they actually haven't won Best Picture. Yeah, yeah. Interesting to think about. It's so interesting to think about. I kind of want to go back and look. I know, like Apple won Best Picture. Mm-hmm. Um, Apple won Best Picture. Netflix and Hulu, Hulu <laughs> with No Mad Land, mm-hmm. and like you're right. This film has great mainstream appeal for audiences, yeah. and has a richness of themes and ideas. And I'm just trying to look in terms of. This came out in November 1967. Budget oh, wow. three million, three point two million dollars worldwide gross, a hundred and twenty-six million dollars. No way. So like wow, this made over like it made like 40 times its budget mm. at the box office. So like yeah, this isn't like a crazy big film. It didn't need like a wow. giant budget or anything like that. <laughs> And it's such an iconic and impressive film. It works so well. This was nominated for four Academy Awards. It won Best Supporting Actor for George Kennedy. Wow. Um, Paul Newman was nominated for Best Actor. It was nominated for Screenwriting. And the music. The music's great. The very like folksy, grass of the earth, salt of the earth kind of just... Uh, Lalo Sh- uh, Chifrim, who did the score, it just really captures the feel of it. This is I such an it. impressive film, and I'm glad that we talked about it. I always love coming back and watching this film because it's a great film. It's in my, I need to spend some time cleaning it up, but I have like my top 500 films, and this is definitely like within like my top 200 favorite films because it's just that's a big deal. Works in, everything works about it. And it's yeah. just one of those really impressive films. But I guess, Joe, do you have anything else that you wanted to add or talk about the film? I feel like we kind of covered most of it already, but for the most part, um, one, it makes me want to check out more um, more Paul Newman, more, more work mm-hmm. by Paul Newman, because I think he has something about that type of presence in film, right? Where, you know, it, as, a, as someone that wants to, like, write a movie or, so, or create something and create a story, it gives you an archetype or it gives you a, a visual to kind of go off. You're like, I want my hero or he, not even if he's a hero or even an anti-hero, I want that archetype in my movie. And I feel like as from the movies I've seen with Paul Newman, I kind of want to mm-hmm. watch more and learn more. Um, but I also feel like this film has, it it to me it's why i don't hate when you order plain pizza at a good restaurant because sometimes you don't need to put a bunch of crap on your pizza to make it better you just need the basic ingredients and it will show for it and and that's what cool hand loot kind of represents for me it's just a well made pizza <laughs> it really works and a couple of paisans can appreciate that uh, uh, metaphor uh I'm surprised so, we didn't. We didn't. We, it took us this long to not just break into A's, you know, and the O's. And the I had to bring up the pizza, though, you know. It just, it just, it kind of slips out. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But this is a much smaller group this month. But we'll be back next month for another film on the movie club here the development hell podcast and since this is our april episode coming out in april our may episode will be coming which is animation yeah so joe's excited he's a big animation fan i'm a big animation fan so we'll see what animated film we'll be watching next month hopefully you all tune in and thank you as always for tuning in and supporting but the development hell podcast